Um, thank you to the Independence Institute for hosting me. And um, I hope that we can encourage one another to be able to truly make a difference. I titled the speech, America's Secret, Secret Weapon, Unleashing the Power of the Individual to Make a Difference. And you know, as individuals, we can all make a difference. We can make a difference for good. We can make a difference for bad. You know, there's a lot of people out there making a difference now in our country. And I imagine if you're in this room, you agree with me that we need to make a difference to defend our country, to defend our liberties, to stand up to those who want so much to change our country into, you know, a, a socialistic type environment where the opportunities that our forefathers fought for are no longer there for us. And you know, it all begins with an individual. We can think of people in our country's history that stood up, that stood up to the powers that be and took a stand. They didn't let the rulers, the, the leaders, you know, run over them. They stood up and they took a stand. They stood together and made a difference. Today I'm going to tell you about some difference makers that were unlikely difference makers, okay? but they've made a huge difference. I'm going to encourage you to make a difference and hopefully give you resources and ideas for encouraging others to make a difference. And Tom is right. The blueprint and what the left did in Colorado can be done on the right. It can be done on the right, but it involves doing something we called uh, playing well in the sandbox, okay? So <laughs> I'll tell you a few stories about an unlikely difference maker. First one, nine, married at 19, okay? Had worked in family's restaurant business, okay? Had her first child a year and a half later, 20 years old. Put her college on hold, okay, to raise six children and homeschool them so that they could have full scholarships to college or almost full scholarships to college and become thriving adults. Through that time, she felt the need to be involved politically. She volunteered how she could. You know, when kids are small, you can only do a little bit. <laughs> when kids grow, you take the kids with you. When, you know, when they get a little bit bigger, you bring their friends. And uh, the kids became involved in politics. And it, be, it, it just grew. This unlikely difference maker then found herself involved in campaigns, head of county parties, you know, state organizations, you know. And in 2008-2010 cycle, this unlikely difference maker found myself in the midst of the Wisconsin story. And I say unlikely because not only had I been, you know, a homeschool mom and came from a small town where I was raising my kids, but I'd gone through a divorce, unfortunately, so I felt, you know, I was broke <laughs> and a little bit broken. And uh, I often felt like, how will I make a difference anymore? You know, how will this work? And I struggled with being a single mom, all those things. But, you know, God often has plans for us that we just don't expect. And in 2008, life would have it that I became involved in building grassroots movement in Wisconsin. And we could see, and I say we, because I got paired up with another unlikely difference maker who started out in a small town in Wisconsin, raised by a single mother. His dad left when he was young, okay. Was always a leader, okay. Student body president all four years of high school, you know, always an entrepreneur. Ended up being the first 18-year-old ever elected in the state of Wisconsin. Ran more statewide races than anybody, okay. Was so successful that the left had to take him out. They decided to try to take him out with lies, accusations, lawsuits. He spent everything he had defending his innocence. And as that case moved to the Supreme Court of Wisconsin, four of the justices had to recuse themselves because they knew him, so it was stalled. So there was a settlement made, 
And the settlement was that he did no wrongdoing, but still had to pay a fine and couldn't work in politics for three years. So that unlikely difference maker, who had been very busy making a difference, was now barred from this profession that he knew. And he spent three years stocking shelves at Target in the middle of the night. That unlikely difference maker went on to be the chief of staff for Herman Cain's presidential campaign. And my counterpart in Wisconsin for the grassroots revolution. And together, we were the ones who invited another unlikely difference maker, Herman Cain, grew up poor in Atlanta, came from a very, very rags to riches story, not really riches, but <laughs> you know, many of you have heard his life story. And the three of us were very unlikely difference makers. You know, I was honored to be Deputy Chief of Staff for Herman Cain's presidential campaign. I was honored to be part of the grassroots movement, the army of grassroots citizens in Wisconsin that came together to help flip that state. And I'm honored to be an unlikely difference maker along with my, my good friends, Mark Block and Herman Cain. And when I think of unlikely, I often think of a, a sweet story from the very first presidential debate. How many of you watched the first presidential debate in, of that cycle? Okay. And, and of course, many of you saw Frank Lunds' special afterwards that said, Herman Cain, you know, top the charts, and, and he became known on the national scene. Well, we were in the green room before the debate. And uh, we were getting, you know, everybody was getting ready and prepping, and Mr. Cain was adjusting his tie in the mirror. I was sitting behind him. And we had decided he should wear the gold tie instead of the traditional red. I mean, it was a point of discussion, but I was like, Mr. Kane, you need to be Mr. Kane. So wear the gold tie, which became a trademark, obviously. But he turned around and said, Hanson, which is what they called me endearingly, Hanson, I just wanted to make $20,000 in a year. <laughs> and I said, I'm just the homeschool mom from Prairie du Chien, and he's just the poor boy from Wyowiga. You know, we're not even supposed to be here. And and I feel like that story can remind us all what can happen if we just walk through those doors, we just take those steps, we're just available to do the next thing that can make a difference. Did I, when I was you know, raising my six children, did I think I would be deputy chief of staff of a presidential campaign? No. Was I honored to do so? Yes. And did it fit at the time? Yes, it did. And I was thankful to be one who asked you know, encouraged Mr. Kane to run and encouraged the team and strategized about how to take him to number one. Okay? But the path to it was very interesting. Okay? And I met Mr. Kane during our Wisconsin, pre Wisconsin years, really. And it was early in uh, 2008, well, late 2008, when I started uh, working with Mark in Wisconsin. And at the time, he was head of Americans for Prosperity in Wisconsin. Wisconsin was the fourth state chapter. And when he started the, his first year, 2005, I think it was, he had 250 grassroots members of AFP. By the time I started working with him, which I never worked for AFP, but I worked for other organizations, you know, but um, I helped him recruit members for AFP because they were our grassroots activists. Okay? Um, but by 2008, when I started working with him after the election in 2008, he had 12,000 members. So we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, I think we can get 50,000 members before 2010, before election day 2010. Let's grow this thing, okay? And not only did we do that, but by the end of 2009, we had our 50,000. So I looked at him, and not one to, you know, sit on my laurels very much. I turned to I said, don't we have 100,000 teachers in this state? Let's go catch them. And so we decided that by Election Day 2010, we should have 100,000 grassroots members in our state. And, and we did. And these were not just, you know, come to an event, we sign you up because you're breathing in in the room members. These were, <laughs> these were the type of members that had to sign up, 
sign either a document or sign up by email, whatever, and commit to doing something. So we had 100,000 people by 2010 that were ready to be engaged okay, in a new way. Okay. We did all kinds of things. We, we really saw from the Colorado model what had happened. And early in our time of working together, we decided we needed to raise the money to fund a study to find out what's the left-right infrastructure in Wisconsin. What are we up against? You know? And what we found was chilling. I mean, I, I sat very proudly as I looked at the, at the PowerPoint slides and thought, oh, here's logos for all the organizations we have. You know, there was this slide that had, you know, the conservative organizations within the state, and I felt very proud that we had these fine people working so hard for conservative values. And then it went on to what the left had, and it was another page of what the left had, and another one. And it was clear that 10 to 1, they were outspending, out-organizing, out-activating us, and we were next on their list. And I looked at Mark and I said, we have to fight fire with fire. And I will tell you that there were many in the establishment who didn't necessarily agree with some of our methods, okay? But we just said, well, you know, we've always been prone to doing things that people said can't be done, so let's just go do it, you know? <laughs> and uh, so we decided we needed to build the capacities of political activity in our state. And where we didn't have something, we needed to start it. So not only were we growing these grassroots activists, but then we didn't really have a, a think tank in our state to provide that intellectual ammunition. Okay, you need to have something to feed your activists. And we had a conservative think tank, but it was very scholarly, very necessary, very necessary, and they did a great job. But we really had a vision for an organization that could provide information that people would talk about, you know, at the bar, at the water cooler, while they're hunting. You know? And so we founded the MacGyver Institute for Public Policy, which many of you know about. Okay. The John K. MacGyver Institute for Public Policy was named after one of Mark's mentors, and, and it really became the source for the intellectual ammunition that the grassroots activists needed to go defend their positions in you know, their neighborhoods and their workplaces. Okay. We also needed to fight things on the legal front. We as conservatives are so weak on this. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the left is great at, you know, one lawsuit after another, after another, after another. I mean, that's why Mark had to work at Target, you know, because of a frivolous lawsuit that it took all his money to fight. He had to work at Target for three years, this brilliant man, you know, but his passion never stopped. And even if we get attacked, our passion cannot stop. We have to stay at it. You know, I look at his time at Target, sometimes like I think of the military um, uh, when, it, this is very bad analogy, very bad analogy because it's not even a good comparison. But, you know, sometimes I, I just heard a, a gentleman running for Senate in Nebraska, and he talked about being a prisoner of war. And he said, if I was a prisoner of war, I can handle Harry Reid, <laughs> which I thought was very good. But, uh, you know, I, I look at that time. Sometimes we're set aside. Sometimes we're, we're in some sort of prison. Maybe it's health issues. Maybe it's economic issues. Maybe it's, you know, an issue like Mark had. Maybe it's something like a prisoner of war situation. We're set aside, and we can't do what we think we can do. But, you know, he never stopped thinking, and his passion never stopped. And while I was raising all my six children, you know, while I was changing diapers, while I was nursing, while I was teaching a Apple A and B Bell B, you know, it's like you're thinking about how to make sure they can have a free tomorrow. How can I help them grow up in freedom and help their children? I have two grandchildren and more on the way, and how can I help them grow up in freedom? You know, and there's, there's a saying, you know, not on my watch. The military has a saying, not on my watch, okay? I don't know about you, but I was bound and determined that I wasn't gonna let Wisconsin fall without doing everything I could because I didn't want it to happen on my watch. And I was just one person. Mark was just one person. 
The 70 some people who started tea parties in Wisconsin were just one person, grandmothers, you know, young moms. They started tea parties, you know, and they bumped heads sometimes with the establishment party, you know. But we had a, a, a saying, we kept saying to everybody, play well in the sandbox, play well in the sandbox, play well in the sandbox. You know, anybody who agrees with you 80% of the time is not your enemy. Let's remember who the enemy is, you know. And one of the things that I think of now with the conservative movement that, that is part of why we are on the defense instead of the offense is because we spend a lot of time and energy fighting each other. And I just think that is so sad. If I could spend as much time and strategic thinking as I do about beating the left, as I do sometimes about how to work around some of the headwinds or opposition I have on the right, I mean, we could really make a huge difference. <laughs> and you know, so if there's anything you get out of this is you can make a difference, you can together make a difference, but in order to be really powerful, you have to work together. Put aside your differences in order to make a difference. I was fortunate to go to a wonderful church uh, for a few years, and they had, um, this was in North Dakota, and I only lived there three years, but I love that church. And they had a sign by the door. It said, in essentials unity, in non-essentials charity. And I think so often we as conservatives need to think about that. You know, what do we need to do to hold on to our country? What do we need to do to hold on to our country? Because it's falling and it's falling from within. Okay. When I think about the Wisconsin story, I, I think about all the many things that we did. You know, that was when the nation was rumbling. I just got asked, do you think we could have another time like the, the Tea Party movement? And I said, oh, a revolution? Sure, let's have one. <laughs> You know, let's have a revolution. <laughs> you know, let's begin it here in this room. You know, but I, I tell you, the nation is ripe for change. We need to have people stand up. And while I often say that the Tea Party became, you know, well, people think the Tea Party's quiet, but I know that there's a lot of Tea Party members in Wisconsin who have become powerful forces for change. And I'll tell you how that has developed. And that's part of how we held the recall. How we held in the recall was because of what happened in 2008, 2010, and all of the, the groundbreaking things that, that began and then were able to be growing by the time it was the recall season. As you remember, during like the 2009, 2010, I mean, things were, were getting nasty. People were upset. They were going to their congressmen and yelling about health care legislation. We had health care town halls everywhere. Tea Party movement was on the rise. We planned a Tea Party in Madison, our most liberal city. Madison, Wisconsin, on April 15, 2009. Okay, we expected two to 3,000 people, and we thought, you know, if we can get two to 3,000 people in Madison, Wisconsin on April 15, 2009, we will be, you know, in like Flint, right? Over 8,000 people attended. They came from all over. They'd walk five miles to, to park, you know, and, and walk in. It was amazing. And Mark and I looked at each other from across that stage and thought, this is something that is so much bigger than either of us, anything we're doing. And, you know, we both felt like God had called us <laughs> to, to something that was beyond us. And I think we weren't the only people in Wisconsin who felt like that. You know, just like any victory, whether it's the Olympic athletes you see on TV now or a, a great business deal, any victory involves many, many people. So please don't think as I'm standing here talking about what we did in Wisconsin that I think, you know, we are responsible for Wisconsin, but we are, we are one. We are an individual who helped work together to make sure Wisconsin flipped. But that 8,000, they went back to their communities and said, well, if we can, you know, if they can do that, why don't we have one in Sheboygan? Why don't we have one in Eagle River? Why don't we have one in Oshkosh? Why don't we have one in La Crosse? You know, and pretty soon, all of these activists who came together were going back to their hometowns. So we started helping them have their events in their small little towns. 
And we took great people. <laughs> we took Herman Cain into some of the smallest towns you'd ever see. We took Steve Moore. We took, you know, Art Laffer. And, you know, I mean, we took Dick Moore. We took all these people into these small towns in Wisconsin where sometimes the event we held was bigger than the town. So, the <laughs> which was great because it brought enthusiasm and it helped educate people. And we had 15,000 people show up on the lakefront in Milwaukee in September before the election. So we knew that after covering every part of the state and looking at that thinking, we want that district, we want that district, we want that district, we knew we had a chance. We had a chance to take that state back. Okay. While we were traveling around the state and hitting all these small towns and stuff, I was always on the lookout for new donors. Those of you who are part of, <laughs> those of you who are donors, we thank you. Those of us who run organizations or run campaigns, we thank you because we need you. We need you. So if you've donated to Independence Institute, we thank you. And to all the donors out there who've, who've been helping us on the front lines, uh, there's, we can't thank you enough. But I was always looking for new donors because we needed them. <laughs> so I would do things like uh, go to industrial parks and go door to door. I mean, doesn't everybody? You know, so <laughs> I would literally go in and say, could I please talk to the owner? You know, could I talk to the person in charge? And say, uh, are you tired of being overregulated? And they'd look at me, are you crazy? And then I'd say, well, how about overtaxed? What about overtaxed? Are you feeling overtaxed? Are you having trouble paying your payroll because of the regulations and the taxes? You know, well, pretty soon their eyes would change like, oh my gosh, this woman gets what I'm going through. And then I would ask them, do your employees understand? Because your employees may be voting to put you out of business and you, they don't even realize it. They may be voting to end their job and they don't even realize it. How many of you in this room are employers or former employers? Okay. How many of you have employees that you are pretty sure don't get it? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I found that all throughout Wisconsin. And, and it really became apparent to me as I met with all these different employers. And so that's how the, the original book, Prosperity 101, was born. Um, I wanted to write something that would be very easy for people to understand. I wanted to help people understand the foundations of prosperity, which really are in our founding documents, the policies of prosperity, and how to protect their prosperity by becoming informed, involved, and impactful. Now, I don't pretend to be a policy expert. I'm more of a... Uh, strategic political hack. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm not a policy expert. Okay, So I called my good friend Steve Moore, whom you, many of you know from the Wall Street Journal, and now he's chief economist at the Heritage Institute. And by the way, I had coffee with him yesterday in DC, and he said to say hello to all his friends in Colorado. So, um, And we're working on a, a new project, so that, Stay tuned for that. Um, but uh, I called my good friend Steve Moore and said, Steve, I know enough about economics to be dangerous, but not enough to be an expert. Could you help me on this? This is my vision for this program. And he was so excited. He said, Linda, nobody's doing this. This is like, this is brilliant. No one is doing this in this country, providing tools for employers to educate their employees. So I wrote the book, and then I had the fortune to present to 500 top managers of a major Midwestern retailing company. And as I was speaking to these 500 top managers who traveled in for this, I thought, we can't rest with the managers. You know, we've got to get to the people who stock the shelves, the people who sell us the light bulbs and the dish soap and, you know, the people who pour the coffee. You know, I started thinking about my own family's restaurants that I helped run when, you know, before I had kids and everything. I thought, how many of those employees understood what our family went through just to pay their paycheck? You know, they probably didn't understand. I wanted a way for employers to have a tool to educate employees. So when a homeschool mom wants to do something, like teach a concept, what does she do? Well, writes a curriculum. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was that's where being a homeschool mom came in handy because it was easy for me to basically lay it out and I wanted it to be something that would be easy user friendly so created workshop materials that employers could use on their own um, and then as this has grown then during the campaign because so this was 2009 I was building this business everything and and taking back Wisconsin, all of this. But then, then came the presidential campaign, 2011. So actually, Prosperity 101 kind of went on hold a little bit during that time. And, uh, but I had it translated into Spanish and worked with a, a few clients around the country and you know, kept it going. Uh, but then after the campaign in 2012 and then this, the, the end of this last year and this year, I've been doing a whole new rebrand and uh, getting new resources and new things together. Um, I still have such a passion to help employers educate employees. And if you are, are in a position to help employers be empowered, this is a great tool. You know, all politics is local. All politics is local. And there's almost nothing more local than your workplace, okay? Where you go every day, okay? You've got your home, your neighborhood, and your work. But so often, employers are afraid to speak up. They're afraid to say anything. They're afraid that, you know, the IRS is going to come after them and audit them, which, you know, they might. But it all depends on how you do it, too. And so I really felt we need to have a way to educate in a nonpartisan way. And if the workplace is such that the employer feels like he's free to talk at a partisan level, you know, great. You know, that that's... That's fine. Sometimes it's a very small business. There's four or five employees, very close-knit group. You can talk freely. Sometimes it's a major corporation. About all you can do is, you know, put a poster up in the break room, you know? Sometimes you can have an HR person direct a workshop, you know? You can have a town hall meeting. You can have monthly emails that go out. I mean, there's such a variety of things that can be done. There's no blanket approach, which makes it kind of hard because people want an easy answer. They want an easy fix. So what I try to do is listen to the employers, give them ideas for what they can do in their own workplace because it has to be something that fits the culture and personality of the employer and the workplace. Because if it doesn't, it will seem canned, it will seem forced, it will seem not right. And the employees won't listen, okay? In Wisconsin, this started to take off. So 2009, I was asked to go all over and do these corporate briefings with employers and employees. And pretty soon we were printing like thousands of books. I mean, thousands of books went out in Wisconsin. And I mean, bad businesses, but I didn't even take a profit. We were just moving so fast. We just like pushed them out. We had people come up and say, you know, I want X amount of books in as many, you know, businesses in Wisconsin as you can get, you know? And so we just pushed them out. And they were a piece of the puzzle that helped take back Wisconsin. And I've heard from other states and other places that they've been very, very helpful to educate. So I feel very happy that I had a tool that could take people one step closer to understanding uh, what they need to understand when they go to vote. You know, a lot of people, if you ask, I mean, if you ask your employees or your neighbors or if you go to the local restaurant and you ask your servers, you know, can you name for me the Bill of Rights? You know, what's the First Amendment? You could say, you know, who's our vice president? <laughs> you know, how do you register to vote? You know, where do our rights come from? Okay. What happens if this establishment is forced to raise minimum wage? What happens if our country is totally dependent on foreign oil? You know, we could just go through scenario after scenario after scenario. And they don't, they don't understand. Because the mess messaging by the left has been so good to convince everybody that somehow it's OK to be dependent. It's OK to just be led, to be a lemming, <laughs> to be led, to be able to, to have all your needs met, because the government will just take care of it. Somehow, the left forgot to tell them that the government has nothing until we give it to them first. 
And where does it come from? Healthy businesses. Businesses are the backbone of economy, as you all know. But you know, the employers, or the employees, the students, the servers at the local restaurants, they don't understand. So when we can educate them in a way that they don't feel like it's pushed down their throat, but in a way that helps the light bulb go on, we can begin to make a difference. And it's not the only answer to taking back our country, but it's one answer, okay? I wanna tell you about some other unlikely difference makers that evolved out of this in Wisconsin. Um, meet Jim, okay? Jim runs a family-owned business. Um, they've had it for many, many years. It's an industrial uniform, um, Absorbtech, ITU. Um, they have a great organization, a quality individual. He's, he's just a humble man, you know, cares about his family, wants to carry on the tradition of his father, it takes care of his employees, loves his country, but he wasn't very involved politically or anything, okay? 2010, there was an article in the newspaper about Prosperity 101, and one of his employees brought him the article and said, could we do this here? <laughs> and he said, oh, so he called me, was not really aware about it. We got talking, and pretty soon, we had a Prosperity 101 seminar at his workplace. We did early ones for the route drivers that were many union members, and then later ones for the uh, management. And then that led to him hosting them for all the businesses in his industrial park. And it led to Prosperity 101 Day among his business across the country, like all the facilities of his business. They had Prosperity 101 Day where his employees were teaching Prosperity 101 workshops. And Jim, who I call a quiet giant, began to encourage other business leaders to do the same. So a business group was born because I started introducing them to each other and saying, you know, iron sharpens iron, you guys should talk, you know? <laughs> and so this group of four or five guys began to be, you know, six or seven or eight. Pretty soon there were women business owners who joined, there were, you know, retired business owners, there were young entrepreneurs. You know, there's a group of like a hundred and some now. And they're just a loose coalition, but they make such a difference. And they work to educate their employees. They work to educate about candidates. They use their email list and their friendship, and they're not even official anything. They just work freely, but every day they're doing something to take back this country. And almost every one of them were not involved until that cycle. So you never know. You know, you can reach one, each one reach one, but the one you reach might reach thousands. And that's how it grows. Another unlikely difference maker was the restaurant owner that uh, took his employees, well, he heard his employees talking about the benefits of Obamacare, right? And he thought, hmm, they have no idea. This might put them out of a job. What will I do? <laughs> you know? So he gathered all of his employees together, put 100 pennies on the table, and said, here's 100 pennies, okay? These 25 pennies are what I use to pay for the food in this restaurant. You know, these 20 some pennies are the lights, the air conditioning, you know, the utilities. These over here are the ones that pay your wages and benefits. Here's the taxes. And then he had like three pennies left and he said, this is what I take home. But since Obamacare, he took money out of his pocket, put it on the table, and said, I don't take home anymore. That means some of you might not be working here soon. And those of you who are might be, choosing, or might be serving fewer chips and salsa. And you know, simple things like that, simple things like that can wake up our young people, can wake up older people who still haven't understood. But you know, our free enterprise system is something that you know, you know we need to protect or you wouldn't be in this room. We have, I translated Prosperity 101 into Spanish 
um, sometimes at criticisms because I believe, you know, English only. You should, I believe English should be the official language of the U.S. Um, and I got criticized for translating it into Spanish by some on the right. And I told them, the left is speaking to them in their mother tongue. You know, they come to this country for opportunity. They come here because they want a better life for them and their children. But they don't even understand why and how to protect it. So we need to help them understand how important it is to protect this and so that they don't become led astray and become, you know, government dependent and become another statistic that we are supporting with our tax dollars. So I'm glad it's translated into Spanish, and I wish I had the money to translate it into every language that would be applicable so that it would be an easy resource for people to understand and so that they could share it with their children. You know, I want that the immigrants who come here, that they not only know why America offers them that opportunity, but they know how to protect it for their children, and that their children will know how to protect it for their children, because we're losing this. We have an entire generation, almost two generations, of undereducated people. We have people with degrees and diplomas, but they don't have the first idea about what made our country great. You know, they may never have read the Constitution. You know, it's not really required anymore. <laughs> you know, we all had to read it like back in fifth grade, I think, but it's not really required anymore. And I can't tell you how many times when people have picked up my book, because I have the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence in there, and they'll say, oh my gosh, did you know that what's happening is unconstitutional? <laughs> but, well, as a matter of fact, I did, yeah. <laughs> and, and this is it. We just have to work to re-educate an entire generation. So we want them to become independent thinkers. Just like, you know, as a mom, I did not want my children to just regurgitate what I taught them. You know, so I encourage them to question. I encourage them to learn. I knew if I could teach them to read well and to love learning, I could get hit by a bus and they would be fine. Okay, that's what we need to do with our employees. We need to help them to be able to sift through all that they're hearing and begin to discern the truth and what it matters to them. So when they hear, you know, oh, yeah, you know, higher taxes will help provide benefits, you know, well, where do the taxes come from? Do they stop to think? Do they stop to think that profits aren't bad, that profits are necessary to run a business and provide jobs? Somehow it has become the norm to demonize the entrepreneur. You know, it has become norm to, to demonize those who actually, you know, made a profit and maybe, you know, built a house that's nice or have a vacation home or are enjoying the fruits of their labor. You know, I was talking with a 23-year-old one day and she said, um, oh, I can't believe these rich people, these rich people. I think it was when Papa John's was in the news, the owner of Papa John's was in the news about their uh, fancy house. And I said, so what if you built a fancy house? You know, he worked hard for his money. Well, he should be sharing that with his employees. I said, he does share his money with his employees. <laughs> you know, I said, I'm sure they, you know, they get wages, they get benefits, they get raises, they get, you know, perks. They have food in the break room. They have, you know, half price meals or whatever the benefits are. I said, you know, why does he have to, you know, share more? And she said, well, they have less. I said, well, how much do you make an hour? And she said, $10. I said, well, I know people who only make eight. So I think then the government should mandate that out of every $10 you make, $1 is given to the person who only makes eight. So this young person <laughs> looked at me and was like, that's not what I meant. You know, of course it wasn't. I said, of course it's not what you meant because that's your money. You know, it's your money that you're working for. Why are we demonizing the people who have been successful? That's what America's all about. You know, that's why people come here to grow. So, you know, really, I, I just want to encourage you, okay? Um, America can be won back as we take back our states like we took back Wisconsin, 
as we unite together and remember what our focus is. Our focus is not on working in silos. Our focus is not on criticizing our team members, fighting against those who are supposed to be on our side of the goal line. Okay? We need to be focused on fighting against those who are our opposition, the ones who want to take the opportunity away from our children and grandchildren. And I hope that the Prosperity 101 resources that you have, I hope they can be helpful to you. Um, I hope they can be helpful to friends and neighbors that run businesses and things. And you know, let me know. Because if you don't see something that you need, I would love to do, I've done a lot of custom workshops, custom items for people. Because I believe the best way to make it effective in a workplace or anywhere is to meet the need of the person. So I encourage you to go out and be a difference maker. Okay? If, if a gentleman who got uh, stuck working at Target in the middle, you know, in the middle of the night for three years, okay, could go on to run a presidential campaign and become internationally known as the smoking man, which I'll tell you a funny little story about that. Who remembers that video? The Kane video with, okay, a little story about that. 24 million people have seen that video. And it was not an ad. It was a, a quick take where he was just going to thank our supporters. Okay, the video guy had his camera over his shoulder and said, Mark, you wanted to thank the supporters, you know, it was right after the Las Vegas debate. And um, so Mark just did it one take. He had a cigarette in his hand because he smokes and he smoked it. And then they're like, oh my gosh, we have the cigarette on there. <laughs> so they ran into me, I'm not kidding you, they ran into me and they said, Hanson, Hanson, they were like two little kids coming in, they were really kind of cute. They came in and they're like, Hanson, we got the cigarette on film. We need to know if we should leave it in. We need a homeschool mom's opinion. <laughs> so I watched that video like three times, and I said, um, we always tell Mr. Kane to be, you know, let Kane be Kane. We need to let Block be Block. I said, you know, you're not the only person in the country who smokes, and we'll take heat from it, but this is our campaign. We're a little outside the box. We're a little edgy, and we're about the people out there. And there's a lot of people out there who don't want the government telling them they can't smoke. If they want to smoke, they want to smoke, you know? And so I said, leave it in. So we left it in, and, you know, we went up three points overnight. We went up three points overnight. <laughs> So, you know, a little behind the scenes story, you know, but, and it's kind of funny because even today, you know, we'll be in, you know, random cities across the country and people will stop him at a stoplight or he'll be outside smoking somewhere and then they'll be like, you know, you look like, you're, you're that guy, you're that guy. <laughs> and, you know, he'll, he'll go, well, maybe I am that guy, you know, and he'll take a puff. And then, of course, then they hand me their cameras and say, could you please take a picture, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, who would have thought? Who would have thought? But he embodied something by that. And an unlikely difference maker, okay? I'm an unlikely difference maker. You may be. And you may know someone that you need to go encourage because they have a sphere of influence that maybe you don't, but they're afraid to speak up. So I really want to encourage you, and I'll finish with just one story, okay? One more story. I have two sons, four daughters. When my middle son, well, he always wanted to be a Marine. So, um, and when he decided to sign up, okay, he was still in college, everything, he decided to sign up for reserves. He called me to tell me he was going to go do it. It was right after his freshman year of college. And I'm on the phone talking to him saying, well, are, are you sure? You know, are you sure? You know, what about Iran? What about North Korea? You know, what about these hot spots? Are you sure you're ready? He said, mom, you know, <laughs> you can see the look. All of you who are mothers know the look, you know. I could see it from the other end of the phone. He said, mom, what have you taught me since the day I was born? He said, freedom isn't free. What if people like me didn't go do this, Mom? Of course, I stood there and said, I'm feeling a little bit like when I taught you how to talk, and then I had to tell you to be quiet. But, <laughs> but I said, you're right, son. 
you're right. He said, Mom, I'll go do what I do so you can do what you do. And to this day, I can't say that without getting choked up because, well, I love all my kids. He nearly lost his life several times in Iraq. He did two tours of Iraq, and he lost dear friends. And when I think of the battles I've fought or the knives that have been in my back because I choose to play in this blood sport called politics, I think of him. And I think of my grandfather in a foxhole. And I think of Washington crossing the Delaware. And I think of all those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Can we do no less? Thank you.